And then you want to go ahead and um, let everyone in. We can indicate yeah. that uh, Governor um, Barnhill is on is is here, but his picture is not up. OK. Shannon, are we live? Should be. Yes. OK, yes. great. Thank you. Well, I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is a meeting of the Wayne State University Board of Governors. Uh, I know that um, many of you are joining. In fact, all of you are joining by live stream, and I'd like to welcome uh, those of you who are doing so. Hopefully, this will be the um, the last time, at least in a while, that we have to do this virtually, and we'll be able to get together uh, soon. We'll start off the meeting with a roll call, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Governor Barnhill. Here. Governor Bazuido. Here. Governor Gaffney. Here. Governor Kelly. Here. Governor Kumar. Here. Great. Governor Land. Here. Governor Stancato. Here. And Governor Thompson. Here. A quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda, and I'm requesting a motion that the Board of Governors approve the consent agenda as presented. Approval of the official proceedings of December 3rd, 2021. Approval of a transfer from the contingency reserve, 175000 to fund the search for a new VP slash general counsel. Approval of a cohort pricing model. Establishment of a Joint Doctor of Medicine and Master in Business Administration program. Change the name of the Bachelor of Science in Elementary Education to the Bachelor of Science in Early in Elementary Education. And discontinuance of the Bachelor of Science in Electric Transportation Technology program. Is there a motion for to approve the uh, consent agenda? So moved. Support. Uh, Great. It's been uh, moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next is approval of personnel actions. The board will consider personnel recommendations presented by the administration for approval. Provost Corn Blue has submitted two recommendations. The first is for recommendations for tenure, promotion to full professor, and administrative appointments. The first action requested is a motion to approve the personnel recommendations as presented. Can I get a motion? So moved. Support. Okay, is it moved and, and supported? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, the next is for a senior uh, administrative appointment for the appointment of a new dean of the College of Fine Performing and Communication Arts. Uh, Provost Cormlew, do you want to add anything on this candidate? And then I will read the action requested. My fault. Yes, thank you. President Wilson and I are uh, pleased to be able to recommend uh, Hassan Alahi um, to be the new Dean of the College of Fine Performing and Communication Arts. Um, Hassan has his BA from Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania and his MFA in printmaking from Cranbrook Academy of Art. Um, he has a extensive administrative experience. He was chair of digital media art at uh, San Jose State University, director of digital cultures and creativity honors college at University of Maryland. And he, is and he will be coming to us from um, George Mason University where he's professor and director of the School of Art. Um, he, he has extensive experience in interdisciplinary collaboration, 
um, and he is himself an exceptionally active and innovative artist. His art has shown around the world from the Biennial in Venice to the Pompidou Center uh, to the Tate Modern. Um, as an artist, he's awarded uh, uh, many honors, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a uh, and he's a member of he uh, serves on the National Advisory Council for Creative Capital and the Advisory Board for New Media Caucus. Um, we believe that he will be an inspirational and transformative leader for the college. Uh, thank you, Provost Cornblue. I'll uh, go ahead and read the uh, motion. Um, President Emory Wilson and Provost Mark Lawrence Cornblue recommend the appointment of Dr. Hassan Ilahi as Dean of the College of Fine Performing and Communication Arts. This appointment is for a five-year term, effective March 1st, 2022. Can I get a motion to approve? Motion. I hear a motion. Can I get a second? Support. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I'm, I'm sorry, President Wilson. Could I get the maker of the motion, please? I think uh, it was uh, Kumar. Dr. Kumar approved. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, Governor, Governor Singh Kato supported, right? Thank you so much. Okay, any discussion? All in favor, signify. Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go straight to the uh, president's report. And I'm, I'm going to do something a little different to start off today, uh, something that I normally uh, don't do. But, you know, given the um, two years being in the pandemic and the service that the Campus Health Center has provided to our campus community. I, I just think that we're extremely fortunate to have had their knowledge, their expertise, and their dedicated staff uh, on our campus, protecting our campus community and putting the welfare of our students, faculty, and staff at the top of the, uh, their focus. And I just wanted to just say a few words about them. Uh, the center has come a long way when, from when it was first opened as a pilot project in 2005. And at that time, it was located in the Atchison Hall and staffed by one nurse practitioner and one medical assistant operating out of renovated dorm room space. From there, as the need for services grew and as the center established itself as an important resource for all students on the campus, it moved first to the DeRoy apartments and then in 2019 to its new state-of-the-art facility in Anthony Plain Drive Apartments. This new space has allowed expansion of its services to the entire Wayne State community. The build out of the new clinic was funded jointly by the university and the Nurse Scene Practice Corporation, which is the faculty practice plan of the College of Nursing. In a typical year, the center schedules more than 10,000 appointments provides clinical learning opportunities to over 200 Wayne State students, holds approximately 100 outreach clinics in more than 15 buildings, and reaches countless students at 50 annual health programming events across campus. The center has also been at the center of clinical operations during various challenges arising on campus, including the discovery of Legionella, providing testing and education, and has been recognized as a model of excellence in university health centers. Since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, the Campus Health Center has served as a hub for clinical services, including testing, isolation, and quarantine, as well as vaccine administration. The model of clinical care and especially individual contact tracing offered by the CHC has been cited by the Detroit Public Health Department, as well as the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services as a model of care for universities in the state and beyond. Healthcare workers everywhere have been pushed to the limit during the pandemic. I think we all know that. And I think it's just important that we recognize the tremendous efforts of the staff of the Campus Health Clinic under the leadership of Tony Grant and Lori Claybo, who have all gone above and beyond our expectations. So. To the center, uh, thank you very, very much. Um, 
you know, next, I just want to uh, mention that uh, our timing was impeccable and we were able to uh, have in-person commencement this year at de on December 13th and, and 14th. Uh, it, it was uh, the first in-person commencement in, in a couple of years. Uh, we did have to make some uh, COVID-related modifications, but it turns out the modifications were actually uh, some of them were actually pretty good, and we may want to uh, adopt them even when uh, we don't have uh, COVID-related issues. But it was certainly a very special time to see our students uh, walk across the stage in the beautiful Fox Theater and receive their diplomas. Over the two days, more than 3,000 graduates and a very limited number of guests, including several members of the Board of Governors, gathered to celebrate their accomplishments. I anticipate that our commencements moving forward will be in person, including the commencement redux we are planning in April for those students who graduated during the pandemic but were unable to participate in an in-person program. Let me go on to uh, some things related to uh, academic success and global engagement. Wayne State University, in collaboration with the University of Windsor, will be officially designated as the United Nations Regional Center of Excellence and will join the International RCE Network, which supports and promotes the UN Sustainable Development Goals Agenda. The Detroit Windsor RCE Regional Center of Excellence will build on and expand the Sustainable Development Education and Research Initiatives underway at Wayne State University, the University of Windsor, in the two urban centers, Detroit and Windsor. Leading this effort at Wayne State University was Vice President Ahmad Ezzedine, Dean Steffi Hartwell from, from this uh, class, Daryl Pearson, Director of the Office of Sustainability, and Professor Elena Pass. Working with their counterparts from the University of Windsor, the team engaged a wide network of stakeholders Holders, including the cities of Detroit and Windsor, school boards, including DPS, economic development agencies, and community organizations on both sides of the border. Faculty from both organizations were also involved in the planning process and will be actively engaged in the Detroit Windsor RCE activities. Also, under our global initiatives, Wayne State University has been selected by the U.S. Department of State as an institute partner for the 2022 Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders. Beginning in mid-June, the university will host 25 of Africa's bright, emerging public management leaders for a six-week leadership institute. This is the second year Wayne State has been named a partner. The Mandela Washington Fellowship, <coughs> excuse me, is the flagship program of the Young African Leaders Initiative, which empowers young African leaders through academic coursework, leadership training, mentoring, networking, professional opportunities, and local community engagement. Finally, I'll end with just a, a few things about athletics. The graduation rate report published by the NCAA so continued good news for Wayne State, reporting a 77% graduation rate for our athletes. For the 2014-15 cohort, the top sports were in women's golf with 100%, baseball 94%, volleyball 94%, women's fencing 91%, and men's golf 86%, with other sports close behind. And then finally, as part of the College Swimming and Diving Coaches Association of America's Centennial Celebration, the association announced its list of 100 greatest college swimming and diving coaches of the past 100 years. And Wayne State University men's and women's swimming and diving coach Sean Peters was among the group selected and honored. That concludes my report. Um, we'll move on to the uh, chair's report, Governor Kelly. Thank you, President Wilson. Uh, since the, the board met last, uh, board members have been active meeting, especially with the Health Affairs Committee chaired by Governor Basuito. It's met on uh, December 6th, December 20, December 6th, uh, January 6th, and it will be meeting again on February 3rd. 
At that um, December 20 meeting, we also had a long discussion uh, about our strategic plan, the, uh, the, the version that was before us at the time. We inputted material into it uh, and suggested changes, all in preparation for the final adoption, which we hope will happen today at this, at this meeting. Uh, in addition to that, we've, we've discussed on several occasions at length how to reform our budget and set strategic priorities. Uh, this initiative has been particularly uh, um, carried forward by Governor Barnhill. Um, and as the president told you, four members of the board attended the, the December commencement programs on December 13 and 14. As those who follow this board's meetings know, this board is committed to doing our business in public whenever it's possible. Uh, over the past few years, we've discussed and we've recognized that in many of the other state universities, a culture has evolved, resulting in those boards conducting many of their discussions in executive session, particularly discussions involving matters that cause conflict among board members, conflict with staff, matters that cast the university in a negative light. Our board has taken note that in some other state universities that continue to function in this culture of secrecy, their boards have been unaware of serious problems or have failed to confront facially serious problems involving their universities. And those problems have exploded into public scandals, harming the universities and the members of the university's community. This Board of Governors has stringently limited the matters we address behind closed doors. And we restrict them to those matters commonly recognized as necessary to be done under closed, behind closed doors, such as uh, our strategy in active litigation or plans to purchase real estate. I'm proud of this board and of our administration that supported us in changing the culture of secrecy um, finally, as this meeting is my last as chair of the board, I'd like to thank the members of the board for their success in working so well together and in minimizing discord on the board and for making it possible for the board to strengthen the board's reputation, uh, the strengthen the university community and to strengthen the university itself. And that's the end of my report. Thank you, uh, Chair Kelly. As um, um, as the chair mentioned, um, the board has functioned exceedingly well. But I, I do want to just mention that uh, that comes from the tone that was set by the chair. And so, congratulations to you, Chair Kelly, for all the work that you've done over this past year to make this a, a really a, a, a pleasure of a board to work with, and I think has done so much over this past year. So, thank you, Chair Kelly. Thank you. Next, we have uh, reached a point for uh, the formal adoption of the fiscal year 22 to 27 strategic plan, which, as you know, has been in development for more than 12 months. And I'd like to ask Michael Wright to provide an overview and background on the recommendation for this important action by the board. Thank you, President Wilson. I'll just take a moment and share my screen. For some reason, isn't allowing me to. Julie, do you have the? Uh, do you, by a chance, Julie, have the thing? It's not allowing me to share. I do not. But if you send it to me, I can upload it. All right. Sorry, everybody. Talk among yourselves for just a second. Hang on, Julie. All right, I think I figured it out. Can we all see this or is it loading? Not yet. Yes. It's loading. 
Can we see it now? Yes. OK, I have a very strange format on it, so hopefully you can follow along with me. Please forgive these these digital situations that occur. Uh, with the direction and input of the board over the past year, we are now at the point where we would recommend that we adopt the 22 through 27 strategic plan, which we're calling our moment in time. St strategic planning is a difficult endeavor in any complex organization like a university. In a pandemic, it is it's even more complex. And it's difficult when you're constrained from rolling up your sleeves and being around a table and being able to exchange ideas quickly and easily and build upon them. Nonetheless, we persevered. Uh, we were, we've really been hard at developing a strategic plan for about 10 months. That's when we met with the board to set the initial direction. I think during a pandemic, those 10 months if in pandemic months are closer to 20 or 30 months because it just makes it a lot harder. Nonetheless, we persevered. Uh, the process for development began with the Board of, of Governors last winter, and then we began to gather input from across the university through many different channels, town halls and web portals, stakeholder interviews with key folks, the community, focus groups on our own university, uh, subcommittees around specific strategic focus areas, ongoing discussions with the board, and we've met a few times on this now and had a number of inputs from around the university throughout the entire process. We had a steering committee from across the university that met on a number of occasions and analyzed the input that we had, the competitive data, um, where we've been, our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges, and then developed the goals and objectives that we then shared, refined, worked with, developed, uh, uh, took input on, over the last 10 months. So, um, and now is before you for submission. I'll just go through some of the highlights of it, but I think it really is a reaffirmation of the mission, vision, and values of our university. And with the board's help, we sharpened these, the mission, vision, and vision. You see our vision is now more uh, globally related. These are the values. This is how we work and how we work with each other. I won't read them unless somebody would like to stop. Um, these are the five strategic focus areas. Research and discovery, teaching, learning, and student success, which is really the heart. Outreach and engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and financial stability and operational excellence. And this is a maybe a different sort of strategic focus area for our university, but we've worked very hard to try to figure out how we get the appropriate foundation, financial foundation, so that we can carry out the mission and vision. Some of the key metrics and priorities, and this is these are just examples, but growing enrollment, and we had a long discussion of that this morning, how we are going about that. Campus-wide initiatives to really get people to get back into people with some education to restart, to return to learn and hopefully complete their education. We are still heavily focused on improving graduation rates, both overall and for those who have been historically marginalized. We want to launch the next comprehensive fundraising campaign, and we'd like to continue to advance in our research expenditure rankings. The next steps, if we choose to adopt this, the board chooses to adopt this today, we will launch this with communications internal and external, which we are prepared to go live with. And a lot of that will hit Monday. We'll have a town hall uh, Tuesday, for February the 8th, for the entire uh, university community, where we can go through the plan in more detail, take questions from people, et cetera. We want each of the leaders within Wayne State to understand and cascade this plan through the organization so people see where do they fit in the strategic plan and what specifically should they be focused on. And then each of the units, schools, and colleges will be, board, will be uh, developing supporting tactical plans to the strategic plan. So that's a quick run through process and where we are. I'm happy to take questions and I would uh, recommend that the board adopt this plan. Well, maybe what we can do is take a motion first and then discuss it. Oh. Uh, if that's okay. Certainly. Uh, 
as as was uh, uh, mentioned, the first uh, step is to is for the uh, board to adopt the, this plan, and then we'll um, uh, move forward with other steps as as uh, Michael has outlined. Um, so, is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2022-2027 strategic plan? Our moment in time. I'll make the motion. I'll support. It's been approved and seconded. Um, any discussion of this item? Will the town hall be on the Zoom, Michael? It will be. Yes, and we'll send the invitation out Tuesday. Thank uh, you. Or Monday of next week, and then so everybody can feel free to join. And that will be hosted by Governor Kelly, who was gracious to serve on our steering committee throughout the entire process, and President Wilson. And we'll also have the co-chairs of the steering committee present as well. Okay, if there's no further discussion, uh, it's been properly uh, moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for your work on this. I know you worked really hard for almost I'd, a year. I'd like to thank Michael Wright also. He's he's spearheaded this for us and taken all the, the heavy load on his shoulders, and he's done a beautiful job, as always. Thanks so much, Michael. You're welcome. Thank you for saying so. Okay, next, uh, we have two updates of interest. Uh, first, in concert with the discussion we just concluded on the next strategic plan for the university, Ness Fengler and his colleague, Emily Thompson, from Economic Development, would like to provide an overview of the economic impact strategic plan. Ned, um, or yours. Thank you, President Wilson. Uh, Emily and I are really excited to be here today, uh, well, to be virtually here with you today to uh, share with you our uh, revised uh, five-year economic impact strategy. Um, as you'll hear more about from my colleague, uh, we had an, an inaugural strategy back in 2019, but COVID forced us to reevaluate uh, a lot of the role of the university. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit before you hear from Emily about what the plan is and what it isn't. Uh, what it isn't is a work plan for the Office of Economic Development. Much like uh, Michael Wright isn't responsible for the entire strategic plan for the university, at least I don't think he's going to do all the things he just mentioned there, uh, we're not doing all of the things that you're going to hear about here. Uh, much of, of what is, is happening uh, and, and that we're capturing in this plan um, are things being done all across the university, many of which you're very familiar with. But what putting it in the plan does is allow us to uh, lay out what we're already doing um, and an asset map against best practices from around the country and figure out what we're not doing or what we need to do better. Um, and also it allows us to uh, communicate and market to the world the huge economic impact that Wayne State University has here in Detroit and across the state of Michigan so that our stakeholders, whether they be in Lansing or in City Hall or our students or or alumni know about the tremendous economic impact of the university. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Emily Thompson, who is the uh, Director of Economic and Community Development in our office, and she's gonna walk you through the plan that we have developed. Thank you, Ned. Um, can everybody see my screen? Looks good. Yes. Perfect. All right. Now, if I can advance, there we go. Great. Uh, so as Dan mentioned, the Office of Economic Development is charged with creating a strategy uh, university-wide that guides, elevates, and communicates uh, Wayne State's economic impact. Given COVID-19 and the impact that the pandemic has had and is continuing to have on our communities, uh, we decided to revisit our 2019 economic engagement strategy in 2021. And after a series of conversations with key stakeholders, we decided ultimately that this moment in time called for something new. So we kicked off the process of developing our new five-year economic impact strategy in the spring of 2021 with 18 one-on-one -on -one interviews with campus and community leaders. We then researched national best practices and local needs, and we crafted draft goals. In the summer of 2021, we convened working groups organized around each one of our five draft goals, uh, and in doing so, invited an additional 50 Wayne State stakeholders 
to help us refine those goals and then develop objectives and metrics. During this time, we also actively participated in the development of Wayne State's uh, strategic plan, officially adopted strategic plan, our moment in time, uh, serving in the outreach and engagement, DEI and operational excellence working groups uh, and reading through and providing feedback on various drafts. All is to say, uh, as Ned mentioned, our economic impact strategy uh, is informed by and responds directly to our moment in time, uh, as well as national and university best practices and local needs, including those articulated in Detroit Future Cities recently, recently released the State of Economic Equity in Detroit report, uh, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, highlights economic inequities in our region and ends with a call to action. It's our hope that through this strategy, Wayne State will be one of the first, if not the first institution to respond with concrete actions. So our economic impact strategy report uh, begins by acknowledging that Wayne State is a powerful economic driver, that in addition to educating Michigan's workforce, the university is one of the largest employers in the city of Detroit that our campus is a bustling hub of research, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and that we have made and continue to make big investments in our neighborhood and our city. It then shares our vision for and commitment to helping to build a more vibrant Detroit and Michigan with equitable access to opportunity and lasting prosperity for all. The report is structured around our five high-level goals. Uh, these are intentionally comprehensive of work happening across the university. We fully recognize that this means that there may be overlap with other uh, areas of work or university plans like our moment in time. And we see this as a good thing, right, that the plans are reinforcing one another. With that, our five goals are to prepare a diverse student body for and connect them to good household supporting jobs, to ensure that all Wayne State jobs are household supporting jobs and that they're accessible to a diverse workforce, to leverage our purchasing power, our research enterprise, and our entrepreneurship programs to create more household supporting jobs and wealth building opportunities, especially for Detroiters and people of color who maybe have been left out of opportunities in the past, to retain and attract talent through investments and programs that improve quality of life in our neighborhood, city, and region, and to be a thought leader and active partner in equitable economic development. And there are a number of terms in there uh, that uh, we wanted to, to define so that we're all on the same page. And uh, we define those on page 14 of the report. And um, borrowing from Detroit Future City, for example, we define a household supporting job as one that allows an individual to meet their unique needs, whatever those might be, and begin to build wealth. And then we cite both the United Way's Alice Wage and Detroit Future City's median, median wage uh, as starting points for discussion since those concrete numbers are, uh, are helpful. With that, for each of our five goals, uh, we identified four to six high level objectives reflective of work that Wayne State is already doing or planning to do um, and new ideas that came up in those working group conversations. So our goal one objectives are to develop a diverse pipeline of students through K-12 engagement, to expand our already strong and award winning access and success programs, to graduate students that are career ready, financially responsible and culturally competent, to make sure that our academic offerings are aligned with workforce needs and opportunities, and to strengthen alumni and corporate partnerships, connecting students with employers and employees with opportunities for lifelong learning. We then provide sample strategies for each of the goals, things that Wayne State has done or is actively doing to achieve these objectives. So for example, adding new concentrations in fields like healthcare supply chain management, uh, which the Mike Illich School of Business recently did, is one of the many ways that Wayne State is aligning its academic offerings with workforce needs. We also named two to three immediate opportunities. These are things our stakeholder uh, and focus group participants identified as particularly important and or timely. Uh, so for example, helping workers upskill and reskill uh, came up in all of our conversations, uh, including with external stakeholders like uh, the APLU, um, and it's highlighted in our moment in time. So that's something that we're hoping we'll be able to make some progress on uh, in the near future. Lastly, in an effort to reinforce the connections between our economic impact strategy and our moment in time, uh, we specifically call them out in the report. So our first goal and related objectives, for example, support nine of the goals in our moment in time. Our second goal is to ensure that all Wayne State jobs are household supporting and that they're accessible to a diverse workforce, which we hope to achieve uh, by recruiting and hiring diverse candidates and Detroiters, providing employees with training and opportunities for advancement, offering competitive benefits, ensuring that on-campus work experiences are meaningful for our students, 
and collaborating with workforce partners like the Detroit Employment Solutions Corporation, uh, which operates Detroit at Work, a recruiting platform that Wayne State can use to find talent. And Wayne State is already doing a lot to achieve these objectives, like offering tuition assistance and a generous retirement match. And uh, that said, there is always more we could and should be doing, uh, including up implementing the recommendations made by the Social Justice Action Committee and DEI Council around recruiting and hiring, uh, many of which are uh, codified now in our moment in time. So our third goal is to leverage our purchasing power, our research enterprise, and our entrepreneurship programs to create more household supporting jobs and wealth building opportunities, uh, with an emphasis on creating jobs and opportunities for Detroiters and people of color. We hope to achieve this goal uh, by engaging the entire campus community in supporting local and diverse businesses, promoting our procurement opportunities, especially among those small businesses that might not be aware, the ones that aren't at the hiring fairs, for example, um, expanding industry partnerships around R&D, tech commercialization, and experiential learning, uh, with an emphasis on existing areas of university strength, like health and mobility. We want to connect students to entrepreneurial opportunities, both at Wayne State and in the larger entrepreneurial ecosystem. And we want to make sure that we, Wayne State and Tech Town together, are at the forefront of innovative entrepreneurship practices. The sample strategies that we've chosen to highlight for goal three include the University Show Your One Card and Save program, uh, which already is encouraging students, faculty, and staff to explore our neighborhood and shop local. Building on Show Your One Card and Save, uh, we see launching a campus-wide by local campaign uh, as uh, one of those immediate opportunities that I mentioned. So our fourth goal is uh, about leveraging university investments and programs to help make Detroit and Michigan uh, nurturing and attractive to talent. So our four objectives here are to improve physical, I'm sorry, five objectives uh, here are to improve physical connectivity between our campus, our neighborhood and our city, to better leverage our real estate, to add amenities uh, in the area like housing and retail, uh, even green space, to actively engage in neighborhood citywide and regional planning, to encourage service learning, community engaged research and volunteerism, and to deepen and, in and increase the visibility of our institutional engagement in our community. Again, drawing uh, connections between our economic impact strategy and other guiding university plans, we highlight implementing the Wayne framework, Wayne State's campus master plan, as both a sample strategy and a key opportunity. The Wayne Framework recommends repurposing Prentice uh, as a community-oriented building and campus gateway. If achieved, for example, uh, this recommendation would both deepen in and increase the visibility of Wayne State's uh, community engagement. Our fifth and final goal uh, is to be and be recognized as a thought leader and active partner in equitable economic development. In addition to embedding equitable economic development practices across Wayne State, which is what this strategy seeks to do, here we recommend uh, participating in local, statewide, national, and global initiatives that advance equitable economic and community development, uh, and increasing internal coordination uh, around this work, as well as um, awareness and external recognition. The sample strategies that we've chosen to highlight for goal five uh, include our participation in the APLU's Commission on Economic and Community Engagement uh, and designation by the APLU as an Innovation and Economic Prosperity, or IEP, university. We see promoting tools like Wayne State's Community Engagement Registry and newly launched Volunteer Hub as key opportunities that will help us better know, measure, and tell the story of our institutional engagement in this space. For each of our five goals, uh, we identified metrics or key performance indicators, more than 30 in total, uh, primarily things that Wayne State is already measuring, like our graduation rate and research expenditures. Um, we also uh, acknowledge external honors, things like being named a top performer for social mobility by US News and World Reports. In addition to things we're already measuring, we've included a few new things, uh, things like the percent of employees uh, earning above Alice and Detroit Future City median wages, which Human Resources was able to calculate for us. In addition to our internal KPIs, uh, we reference external metrics that we hope to impact through our actions, things like the percentage of individuals in our city and our state with a post-secondary degree, our labor force participation rates, and the overall percentage of individuals earning above those Alice and DFC median wages that I keep coming back to. With that, 
uh, we're excited to start sharing this report with internal and external stakeholders uh, and to start tracking and communicating university wide progress on our goals and objectives. If time allows, Ned and I are happy to take questions, uh, but you can also contact us via the email addresses on the screen uh, after you've had a chance to sit with the report if something comes up. Okay, are there any questions? Well, thank you, Emily. Governor Brown, you I'm, I am sorry, I'm sorry, did not see the hands. Uh, Governor uh, Brown, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, mute their microphones if you're not speaking, it might help on the feedback. Okay, let's try that again. Thanks for sharing that report. I wonder if you can elaborate on uh, your plan to communicate this report with uh, stakeholders in our community, and if you could also elaborate on how you plan on tracking uh, some of the goals that are articulated in the report. Absolutely. So uh, we're still developing our communication strategy around the, the report and um, we wanted to make sure that we're following the lead of our moment in time and not um, confusing anybody uh, in our community by sharing two uh, strategies sort of simultaneously. So I would say um, we're going to wait until uh, our moment in time is released and then we will follow up with our economic impact strategy. Um, we've had a number of conversations with external stakeholders, groups like Detroit Future City uh, and the Chamber about events. Uh, that we could host in partnership um, to, to share this work with their audiences and hopefully inspire other organizations again to respond to, to the data from the Detroit Future City uh, report or to think about how their, you know, how their actions have an economic impact in our community. Uh, but open to suggestions. And then uh, I guess quickly just in terms of, of tracking and communicating, um, we are looking at um, how the Office of Economic Development can better work with uh, internal stakeholders. So making sure that we're in meetings and rooms where things are being talked about that we need to know about so we can communicate them to an external audience. Um, exploring the idea of better using our, our social media and potentially an, you know, an economic uh, Office of Economic Development newsletter and obviously partnering with central communications around things like the engage the community engagement newsletter of the university um, and then our internal channels like today at wayne and get involved too we yeah. have historically done some uh one-off uh publications about the economic impact of the university and we're looking to update those as well uh to really uh you know make it a little more i'm trying to record you know it's collateral material that when you go to a meeting and nowadays online you can present to someone a leave behind that so that shows all the different ways that uh, Wayne State is having its two and a half billion dollar annual economic impact uh, across the university. And I think I see Governor Thompson's hand up. Yes, thank you, President Wilson. Um, so is this, I, I don't know if you mentioned, is this the first time that you've developed this um, strategy? And in terms of it's kind of related to communicating um, how things are going, is there a plan? I think it would be useful to hear um, at the board level how you know things are progressing with this strategic plan. So it'd be helpful to to hear in six months or a year, you know, how things are progressing. Yeah, a big purpose in doing this is to make sure that we're regularly collecting this specific data, so that we're being intentional about driving the you know moving the needle on it. So we will be happy to come back, say annually, to, to to give you updates on it. We did, you know, create a plan back in 2019, much like the rest of the world. Right before COVID, we came up with a whole bunch of plans that got kind of spiked, um, and which is why you didn't get didn't get to hear much more about it uh, as we scrambled for the next two years and figured the world had changed enough that it was time to 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 redo it uh, in a in a po in a endemic COVID in in the current world uh, in which we live. And then are you thinking that you would um, revisit this every five years along with our strategic plan because it seems like it's a natural fit? Correct. This is meant to be a five-year plan sort of done in concert uh, with the university strategic plan. Uh, we have talked about also doing dashboards and other things that could be useful, but you know, right. resources and time are, are limited and we'll see, we'll see the best way to, to, to do that as well. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, before I move on, uh, Governor Barnhill, your uh, hand is still up. I just want to make sure you had your question answered. Oh, yeah, you know what, I'll take it down. Thanks for the reminder, but also just wanted to, to say um, the, the communications on this and Wayne State's economic impact is just very important. Um, you know, we all know that for whatever reason, um, the, the, the story around our impact um, doesn't get the level of traction that I think it deserves. And I think as a result, it's easy for the community to get excited about, you know, a $50 million development here and there um, when uh, our university uh, is continuing to make billions of uh, economic impact in, in the, the city and beyond. So uh, just looking forward to um, future updates on how that's going to be shared. And um, thanks for thanks for the overall report. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. And thank you, Emily. Um, you know, next in these uncertain times, we wanted the board to understand the university's readiness and preparedness during crisis situations. So I've asked Michael Wright, who chairs the university's crisis communications team, to give you an overview of our work in this area. Michael? Yes, thank you. And Julie is sharing the screen, so we shouldn't have the same issue we came up with before. And before I begin on the crisis management team, um, I neglected to say thank you to the board for adopting the strategic plan uh, on behalf of a lot of folks including a big steering committee and our four co-chairs who are some of whom are on this call thank you very much that gives us uh, the fuel to to roll into figuring out what we you know how we accomplish all these things and getting it done so thank you on that um unlike the strategic plans which looks out five years crisis management is often an exercise in speed and immediacy and i thought it would be very helpful uh, from time to time to visit with the board and others throughout the campus to talk about the fact that we exist, that we are thinking about crises all the time because they happen, whether we like them or not, and, uh, and to show that we're doing our best to be prepared and help other people get prepared. So Julie, since you're advancing, if you don't mind advancing to the next screen. Um, this is right out of the crisis manual. We're committed to providing a safe, secure environment for students, faculty, and staff. That's our goal. If you could go to the next slide, please, Julie. This is how we define a crisis. These are the things that threaten first people and then property or the reputation of the university and things that take our attention from our mission, what we ought to be doing in our normal activities. So if we get diverted, we call that a crisis. And it usually or almost always involves immediate, fast and effective attention to whatever that crisis happens to be. Go ahead, Julie, to the next, please. The crisis management team is comprised of these positions throughout the university. I have the honor of chairing it along with Chief Holt. Um, and you'll hear from Chief Holt, who's joining me for this presentation today as well, because the police for most for a lot of crises play a critical role. So you can see that it's a, a full sweep of people throughout the university from facilities to the health center, to the police, to council, finance and business, the board of governors, Julie sits on the committee as well. So Julie, if we can advance, please. I put this simple slide up because it's important, this priority order, safety of people is number one, property is number two, and reputation is number three. And the reason I remind all of us of that, and we remind ourselves of it on a regular basis, that if you flip this order around a little bit, very bad things can happen. Folks that find themselves in a crisis situation and work on number three first, which is a, a natural inclination, let's protect the reputation of the university and therefore maybe not be as forthcoming with information, they end up hurting the, the organization in the long run. We ask ourselves every time we are in a crisis simulation or a real crisis, what is right for the people? What do they need to know? And often we'll go beyond what we think would be absolutely necessary because we want people to know and we want them to be safe. Okay, Julie, next slide, please. So we meet regularly and we, we go through simulations. We make them up, we walk through them. We, each time we do some these, this preparation, um, we learn new things. We note them down, we incorporate them into how we work. Um, 
I'm going to go through some simulations in a little bit. None of them are how we simulate them. Everything is different. But the exercise of continually thinking about who does what, when, and how do we communicate it really has helped us be prepared for some pretty serious situations. We have materials, we have videos, we have things, we work with the police and the website, et cetera, to make sure that that information is available to everybody. We push it out as often as we can. If I have a worry, it is that people don't think about what to do in a crisis most of the time until they're in a crisis. And then um, and then it might be too late. So we, we are constantly trying to push, trying to get people involved. So the biggest thing we do is when a crisis occurs, um, we provide the leadership, the recommendations, the expertise, et cetera, uh, to get us through that crisis. And we and a big piece of everything we've dealt with is how, how do you do communications? Because as soon as something happens and we know about it, the clock begins to run and people need to know. And so we have a very good communications team. We simulate communications on a regular basis for crisis. We've, we've got backups and, and backups to backups and we practice. Next slide, please, Julie. These are some of the actual crises that we've dealt with. And as I look at this list, it, it feels apocalyptic. But um, these are some tough things. And when you look at them all together, you say, wow. But we've, we've hit each of them with a level of readiness that has helped us get through them and helped us get the university community through them. Because it's not just about this group of people. It's about what happens to everybody who's part of this community? How do we keep them safe? How do we keep them informed? How do we make sure we're telling them what we need, but not speculating, not letting rumors run, et cetera? So some of these are pretty serious. I won't go through them. You can see them. The pandemic has been our longest uh, crisis, and that's been a matter of the entire university. Um, once we were in it, everybody has worked and continued to meet, continued to talk, continued to adapt, continued to adopt, and, um, and make it work. Next, please. Uh, I brought the chief on because a big piece of every crisis happens in the police force. You can see some of the um, the data behind the police department, but but chief, you all know Chief Holt very well, and uh, I have the greatest respect and admiration for him. And chief, if you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the police, uh, now is your moment. Okay, I'll okay, try I'll to be, go through some of these slides very slide. briefly. I got a little echo got a little here. Echo. Is that okay? You're good. Okay. okay. Uh, you know, we were established in 1966. Uh, we're a fully commissioned police officer department. All our officers are sworn in as Detroit police officers. Uh, all of them hold bachelor's degrees. That's one of our requirements for becoming a police officer. And we have a lot of turnover because we have officers who come here, get advanced degrees, tremendous training, and they go on to a higher and really better positions. And I sort of encourage that. Uh, next slide, if you would, Julie. Uh, I think this is what I really wanna highlight. We don't really do this alone in a crisis. We have tremendous collaboration with partnerships. Uh, we practice these scenarios at crisis with Detroit Police Department, the Wayne County Shares, and great collaboration with our federal partners. Uh, we did a major scenario on campus a few years ago uh, that the FBI sort of headlined that. We had the Wayne State Police, of course, because it was on our campus, Detroit Police, Wayne County Sheriff's, Michigan State Police, Dearborn Police. It just shows in a crisis, we all come in and we work together on these crises. Our, our number one goal in a crisis, for example, in an active facility or an active shooter, is to immediately neutralize that effect. If we have, a, say, a shooting in State Hall, the officer will respond immediately, and we train for this. Uh, during the winter closure that we just had, uh, the campus was empty, so we had officers in building, training on entry, searching in the buildings, going through scenarios in the building. We are actively at planning another major scenario that we're going to do on campus here. And there are scenarios also involve, involves the student population working with us. We bring them into the building while we're doing the scenarios. We brief them before, we, do, we debrief them afterwards. We need to know their reaction, how they feel, how do we do. We also bring evaluators from outside the university 
to evaluate the work that we do to see if there's some additional training we need to do or if we need to change our tactics, how we respond to these situations. Uh, our next one, if you will, Julie. If, Chief, I could pick it up from here if you want. Yes, go right ahead. Um, so any crisis, or I should say most crises start with the police and they have a particular role to play. And then the background is a lot of people providing expertise, decision-making, communications to support that. Next slide, Julie. I'm gonna go kind of quick because I know we're, we're pressed for time. But the first wave is the, is the police and then the communication clicks off right after that. Um, everybody knows who to notify on the campus, including who needs to notify the Board of Governors. We, we go from text messages to everybody. We flip the, the, um, the website. Text messaging is supported by email, is supported by the web, and supported by the uh, on-campus communications. And then we've also, we're monitoring social media right, for, right from the start, and we work with public relations uh, as well, because each, most crises also result in, in the news being, um, being involved. Go ahead, Julie. Um, so we try to get people to, to, to pay attention. So we do pre communications each semester for the, from the president and the dean of students. We run tests, as I talked about, where people know, see our communications. We do, when, the, when there are difficult crises in other place, often the president comments about that. Wayne State has uh, police responded and we share, these are communications to the, the community to just keep in mind that it's good to be ready. Julie, next, please. You don't need to go through this in detail, but this is our one page playbook in the case of an active shooter, which came tragically back into the news with the Oxford High School, but we practice this. In fact, we practiced it last week and every now and then we run through it again and again in different sorts of flavors to make sure everybody knows what to do. Next slide, please, Julie. We have a video called Run, Hide, Fight that we put together. Um, the unfortunate thing is every situation is different. Active shooter is one of the scariest things and we want people to know that they have to make decisions by, based on their proximity, based on their abilities, based on you know a, a lot of things so we want we, we encourage everybody particularly fact faculty i'm oh, sorry uh particularly faculty who are often looked to as leaders in an emergency situation i'm not going to play this video but it's available to you on the police website next julie and we're always asking for participation from everybody in the campus and leadership sign up for the broadcasting visit the police website because you can there's a lot of different things to to view a lot of you can you can sign up for training i think we should speak confidently about wayne state but we never get overconfident because things happen um, we ask people to pay attention to the communications we ask people to communicate to the organization and if you see something say something and first step is always call the wayne state police next julie Okay, that um, that concludes my very quick presentation. Happy to take questions. So, oh, uh, Governor Thompson. Thank you so much, and thank you for the presentation. Um, just a question and a comment. Um, the question: How often do you do these um, drills? And um, do, is this? I know that Julie or um, Secretary Miller is on the, the board for this, um, but how often do you meet and do you, you know, report back to the board? Because we hear when there's a crisis, <laughs> but mm -hmm. not necessarily everything that you're doing. And then the comment I just want to make is I, I commend uh, Chief Holt and the Wayne State Police for the, you know, for the excellent work that they do um you know they're known community-wide and um you know beyond for the fabulous work that they do well I'll, I'll take that in reverse order and then first echo the um the respect and admiration for the chief and his team who do an excellent job and thank you for that chief regarding the frequency of meetings the the chief's drills are different the big ones so they happen i'll, I'll let him speak to that we were on a monthly meeting basis as the crisis team. And each time we go through a different sort of scenario, and often that's 
you know, me working with somebody else and we just spring it on folks and we walk through it. The pandemic got us off of that schedule because we were sort of in a crisis, a live crisis for so long. We're just now getting back um, to more frequency. So I would say it's going to be once a month or once every other month at the latest. As far as communication with the board, um, we can communicate anything you like. I, th these things are note-taking exercises, but I'm not sure it would be um, of interest to you. But when we do, whenever there's a crisis, one of the questions we ask is, does the board need to know about this? And if it's a big thing and we're gonna put out a communication, uh, we're moving fast, but that's a, that's, a, that's a step before everybody knows the board needs to know. And um, we sort of manage that on a case-by-case -case basis. Chief, I don't know if you want to talk about how often you do yep. your simulations. Sure. We do major simulations. We try to do once a year. Uh, major simulations with our partners, uh, we do maybe every quarter. Training within a department, we do that monthly. Have a captain of line operations, uh, Captain Saunders, he assigns training to each shift in terms of building entry, uh, canine tracking. We're doing training monthly. Uh, we're not waiting for an incident to happen. We go to different buildings within our own buildings. So that's that's the monthly training exercise that we go through. Thank you. OK, I don't see any other hands, so I think we should uh, move on then. Um, three of the board standing committees met this morning, the Student Affairs Committee, the Budget and Finance Committee, and the Academic Affairs Committee. And I'm going to be calling on each of the committee chairs for a short report. The first committee is the Student Affairs Committee, chaired by Governor Stancato. Uh, thank you, President Wilson. Uh, the Student Affairs Committee met this morning, and we heard two informational reports. The first was an overview of our revitalized efforts to support our diverse student body and how diversity, equity, and inclusion is built into our mission. Now, the strategy includes advancing intercultural understanding and communication, engaging the faculty in cultivating inclusiveness and belonging, among other initiatives. The committee also received a broad overview of the Office of Multicultural Student Engagement, called OMSI, and how the work of this office will support these initiatives in our diverse student body. So OMSI basically is gonna support the multicultural student success from pre-college to graduation and, and then even sometimes beyond. The second report was an enrollment update for winter 2022. The committee received an overview of national enrollment trends and comparison data for how what's happening at Wayne State University occur, that's occurring and then also what's going on throughout the state. Um, the committee then reviewed enrollment trends for Michigan public universities, which by the way, almost all of them showed a drop in enrollment. Compared to winter 2021, Wayne State has 1,200 fewer students in headcount, which is consistent with national trends. About 60% of that drop is the graduate students, and, and then further 60% of that is concentrated in specific graduate programs. Transfer enrollment continues to be strong for Wayne State, and the committee looks forward to further analysis and discussion of these numbers at a future meeting. That concludes my report, President Wilson. Uh, thank you. Uh, next was the Budget and Finance Committee, chaired by Governor Barnhill. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and just, just as an FYI, everyone, uh, my children are practicing their guitars in the background. So if the, our new dean of fine arts is listening, <laughs> the two young to be recruited. <laughs> We have a new for that. The Budget <laughs> Finance Committee met this morning and we heard several informational reports. Uh, we also approved the new cohort pricing model and as well as acted on requests for a transfer from the contingency reserve. The action items were included on the consent agenda that was just approved earlier this afternoon. The cohort pricing model provides the provost and the senior vice president for finance and business operations with the flexibility to develop and implement cohort-based tuition pricing models and also allows the university to expand academic partnerships with companies, community organizations, government agencies, and other educational organizations in a variety of ways. Next, Senior Vice President Masseron presents some process thoughts regarding Wayne State University's budget process and opportunities to reform the current process with eyes toward the future. We discussed the general fund structure, structural deficit, 
reasons why the university should make changes in the way it budgets in order to address financial needs and also the various factors and components that are a part of this consideration, including um, not limited to state appropriations, tuition and fees, as well as financial aid on the revenue side and the growth of annual expenses, including things such as compensation um, and benefits, among others. We spent some time as well discussing various options for a five-year multi-budget, uh, multi-year budget, as well as the various drivers for revenue and expenses. It was a very thoughtful discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the participants on the committee and, and the senior vice president uh, for that. Uh, and I feel like we're just beginning. Um, I sincerely hope that we continue these sorts of fruitful discussions uh, at our next meeting uh, in the meetings to come. Our final two reports were those that uh, the committee typically reviews each time it meets. Uh, one is a summary on the progress for major capital projects and the other, the purchasing exceptions report, which reviews the list of contracts that were issued without competitive bids. Uh, thank you, everyone. Mr. President, this concludes my report. Uh, thank you, Governor Barnhill. And it sounds like you've got a little bit of talent back there. Um, the next was the uh, Academic Affairs uh, Committee chaired by Governor Gaffney. Thank you very much. This morning, we had one major report. We heard a very good comprehensive presentation on enrollment strategies 2022 to 2025 from Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs, Ahmad Ezzedin. There was much discussion that resulted regarding our exciting possibilities for increasing enrollment. We all agree that the future increases in enrollment are a key to a successful university. In addition, the committee voted to add a program, a joint MBA program for doctor candidates in the medical school. This is a three-year MBA degree Secondly, we changed the name of the Bachelor of Science degree in elementary education to Bachelor of Science degree in early education and elementary education, responding to national trends. And lastly, the committee voted to discontinue the Bachelor of Science degree in electric transportation technology. There are numerous other degrees in the engineering department and the business school um, that did the same thing. So this one was redundant. Thank you very much. That's my report. Uh, thank you, Governor Gaffney. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, information reports from university administration. I'll call on appropriate cabinet members to provide highlights and updates of his or her report. Uh, first would be Provost uh, Cornblue. He, he will be given an overview of centers and um, institutes, and that'll be followed by an action item on a charter renewal. But before he does that, um, uh, Provost, do you have anything else that you want to update on the academic affairs report? I, I just want to thank the faculty and staff and students for how we started this semester. I mean, transitioning to be online for three weeks and then go back to in person. Um, you know, two years ago, we never would have imagined that we could do this. And we did this really smoothly. The faculty um, and academic staff did an amazing job of starting the semester, you know, in one modality. And the president announced last week we're moving back to what we planned for the semester semester, which will be mixed modes. And um, this is run, you know, pe people are, have understand the situation we're in, and there's just a great deal of understanding and support on each side. So I want to thank everybody for that. Um, we uh, we thought we'd give you just a very brief overview of centers and institutes. Centers and institutes are an essential part of any research university. It's the way we organize interdisciplinary and intercollegiate activities on the campus. Um, these are governed by board regulations and governed by the board. Um, there are um, 
there, there are two different types of centers. There are type one centers, um, which report to the provost, and there are type two centers, which report up to the vice, vice president for research. The vice president for research centers are completely focused on research. The ones that report up to me um, across the different mission of the university. So they might have research, they might have education, they might have community engagement as well. Um, there are also th those types of centers sort of that cross the mission of the university that are within a college but are interdisciplinary and they report up to the dean and through college governance. Um, the reason we wanted to go over this is we is that for university centers, these, these are chartered for five years and then we have a formal review process. Um, the academic senate and the policy committee are very much involved in that. Um, it has been several years since we had renewed, we had uh, either created a new center or renewed centers, and we are in a process now. We have a lot that will be coming up for renewal. So um, the first one that's coming up for uh, renewal is the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Institute. Um, I think Julie shared with you all yesterday uh, a major new grant that is going to this institute to support providing a COVID vaccine nations to uh, uh, people who with disabilities throughout the state. So it's just an example of the excellent work the center does. The center did a self-study that self and that, that self-study was presented to a review committee with members appointed by the academic senate. Um, that, that review committee wrote a report that went to the policy committee of the Senate. The Senate had feedback to it and input, um, and the Senate has recommended uh, renewing, the char renewing the charter, and I, I share in that recommendation to uh, the president. Okay, very good. Uh, with that then, uh, we do need a, um, an action a motion that the Board of Governors renew the charter for the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Institute through December of 2026. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay, Second. okay. it's been uh, properly uh, motioned uh, and uh, seconded. Any discussion? Um, all in favor signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Uh, motion carries. Uh, Vice President Lanier, would you like to highlight anything on your research report? <clears throat> Thank you, President Wilson. Uh, the report provided in your booklet is a summary of numbers and funding to the university for the first quarter. Just an idea indicating things are steady as we go forward. I just want to add one comment uh, to discussion today as we come hopefully move forward uh, with classes next week and hopefully move forward uh, with the pandemic, uh, managing the pandemic and pivot forward. I have been involved with uh, a lot of interviews for faculty over the last two or three weeks. And I usually get involved with a lot of faculty interviews for recruiting and research programs, et cetera. And I have to share that um, I've been so impressed with the applicants that we've been having come into uh, the programs and express an interest. And this cuts across medicine, uh, pharmacy, chemistry, um, Institute of Gerontology, Merrill Palmer's Gilman Institute of Child and Family Development. And many of the missions of these programs are tied into what we do in the city. And I've just been struck by the, the high quality of the individuals that are interested in, in Detroit and what we're doing here. And even more so than I've seen uh, before the pandemic. I don't, I've just, I'm really impressed and, and, and I think it's part of the forward momentum we're seeing as a university. And I just wanted to share that, that thought. Uh, so I'm really excited about uh, the future on this regard. That's all I have, President Wilson. Thank you. Uh, we do have an action item here. We have a university contract with an organization in which a university staff member is a voluntary non-paid board member. So what I'm requesting is a motion that the board of governors authorizes the president or his designee to contract with Michigan Crisis Response Association, Inc. to provide critical incident stress management training to first responders throughout the state of Michigan as a fulfillment of the MDHHS Frontline Strong Together grant. 
funded through the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences in the School of Medicine. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, second, please. Support. Okay, so, uh, it's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion of this item? Okay, this requires a roll call. So, uh, Secretary Miller. Governor Barnhill. Governor support. Buzzito. Okay, thank you. Governor Buzzwito? Yes, support. Governor Gaffney? Yes. Governor Kelly? Yes. Governor Kumar? Yes. Governor Land? Yes. Governor Stancato? Yes. And Governor Thompson? Yes. Motion carries. Great, thank you. We also have another uh, action item by VP Masseron, a university contract with an organization in which a university staff member has an officer of the corporation, is an officer of the corporation um, campus health center. This is a, uh, you, you know, I, actually, um, um, David, could you just ex explain the, the what it is and I'll read the motion after your explanation? Sorry, I left myself on mute there. Uh, thank you, uh, President Wilson. It is three individual contracts with the campus health centers to continue the good work that you described in your presidential report. Uh, Dean Claybaugh uh, is a member or an officer uh, of the organization, although she receives no uh, financial compensation for being as such, and it's a nonprofit. Thank you. So the motion is that the Board of Governor authorizes the president or his designee to enter into three individual contracts with the Nursing Practice Corporation. Dean Lori M. Lazan Claybo, by virtue of her role as Dean, is also the president of the Nursing Practice Corporation, which is the faculty practice plan of the College of Nursing. Uh, can I get a motion? So moved. And Support. A second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? Secretary Miller, roll call, please. Thank you, Governor Barnhill. Yes. Governor Bisuito? Yes. Governor Gaffney? Yes. Governor Kelly? Yes. Governor Kumar? Yes. Governor Land? Yes. Governor Stancato? Yes. And Governor Thompson? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, Vice President Masson, did you have anything else you wanted to highlight from uh, your section? Nope, I, I'm, I'm good to go. Great. Uh, next then would be Government and Community Affairs, uh, Vice President Lindsay. Uh, good afternoon, the board and president. Uh, just one, uh, number one, I want to thank uh, members of the board uh, and members of the university community for again our 2022 uh, annual tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Again, we were challenge to do another virtual event. I want to in particular thank uh, Chair Kelly and President Wilson for their program and all of you for watching and supporting me. We are honored to have one of our very own graduates, Victoria Christian Wilson be our guest speaker and we just turn out very well uh, and the only other thing I can report is that we are sad to see lose a member, two members of our team, uh, Elizabeth Carter, who directs our uh, state affairs, is moving on to uh, other classes on the end. But it's a great opportunity for her, and we're going to miss her work. And so I want to congratulate Elizabeth on a job well done. Uh, there was a lot of uh, feedback, but I think we got the, the gist of what you were saying. Um, Patrick, so we'll move on. Uh, well, I cannot... Yeah, just a minute, President, if I may. Elizabeth yeah. Cutter, I'd just like to say how wonderful she was, and we are going to miss her. So, Patrick, she was good, good for the team. So, uh, sorry we're going to lose her, but we wish her the best. Here, here. Thank you, Governor. Okay, um, moving on then, uh, Economic Development Report, Vice President Stabler. Uh, the only thing I want to add to the report that you have in front of you is that you, you might have seen right before the break that the Detroit region uh, made it to the second round of the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, which is a billion dollar 
national competition run through the Economic Development Administration of the Department of Commerce to um, uh, that will end up awarding after phase two uh, approximately 25 to 30 grants of about 100 million, 70 to 100 million dollars each. Um, and Detroit made it through to the first, the through the first round into the second. And I just wanted to let you know that we are involved in that in many different ways. Um, the proposal is going to be around advanced mobility testing and training, uh, as well as early stage uh, and university, early stage commercialization and university commercialization efforts. Um, so we're sitting on several of the work groups. In fact, TechTown is going to be uh, one of the the lead co applicant for the early stage company support section. So. Uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, this fall we'll get some good news and a hundred million dollars of federal money to the region. Okay, very good. Um, next is Development and Alumni Affairs Report, Vice President Burns. Yes, in addition to the report that I submitted, I just wanted to give a quick update on our plan for the university's next comprehensive capital campaign. We have begun recruiting and hiring new staff to build our capacity to successfully implement a larger fundraising effort. And of course, we began preparing for the new campaign as soon as we completed the last one, Pivotal Moments, back in fiscal year 19. Um, but this month, we began an engagement with an outside firm, Benzweli Fleissner, to evaluate our campaign plan, and that includes looking at our goals, our timeline, our policies, our procedures, our systems, our database, our prospect and donor pool, and the culture of philanthropy across campus. Um, this is a collaborative effort. Together, my team, along with the BWF team, will review their findings to identify the areas of the greatest opportunity, and we'll use this information to make improvements to our plan and to be sure we are using our campaign funds wisely. Um, we know our success is critical to reaching many of the goals that were included in the university strategic plan that was approved today. So we're up for it. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we do have an action item here, and this is uh, I'm requesting a motion that the Board of Governors establish endowment funds that total $3,796,928.90 for the purposes presented. So moved. This has been moved. Can I get a second, please? Support. Okay, it's been properly moved and uh, supported. Any discussion? All in favor, please signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion carries. Uh, we also have another action item in this uh, general area. This is repurposing of an endowment fund. Requesting a motion that the Board of Governors approve the repurposing of the Richard C. Van Dusen Visiting Professor in Urban Leadership. This is a fund functioning as endowment in the College of Liberal Arts into the Richard C. Van Dusen Urban Leadership Forum Endowed Support Fund. This is also a fund functioning as an endowment in the Office of Government and Community Affairs. Can I get a motion? So moved. So, Okay, it's been moved and uh, supported. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, thank you. Uh, the next order of business is the election of board officers for the coming year. Uh, first is the uh, chair position. So I open the floor for nominations for chair of the board. Uh, I nominate Mark Gaffney to be chair of the Board of Governors. Okay, um, nomination for Mark Gaffney by um, Governor Busuito. Uh, uh, is there support? I'll support that. Supported by Governor Kelly. Are there any other nominations? Any discussion? Okay, all in favor to close nominations and elect Mark Gaffney is chair of the board for 2022. Uh, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Congratulations, uh, Governor Gaffney. Thank you all very much. Um, next is uh, for the vice uh, chair position, and I open the floor for nominations for vice chair of the board. 
I, Mr. President, I'd like to nominate Shirley Sincato for Vice President. We have a nomination of Shirley Stancato. Can I get a, a second? I'll second that. Seconded by Governor Gaffney. Are there any other nominations? Any discussion? Okay. Then uh, all in favor then to close nominations and elect Shirley Stancato as vice chair of the board for 2022. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. Okay. I'm, um, I'm, I'm a, so we got. The, we're, let's, we're, do a, we're, let's do a roll call vote on that then, Mr. Yeah, Chris. let's do a roll call. I couldn't quite. Get it. So, uh, um, Secretary Miller, can you do a roll call? Yes. Governor Governor Barnhill? Yes. Governor Brizrito? Yes. Governor Gaffney? Yes. Governor Kelly? Yes. Governor Kumar? No. Governor Land? Yes. Governor Stancato? Yes. Governor Thompson? No. Uh, motion carries. Okay. Um, the motion carries then. Um, congratulations, uh, Governor Stancato. Thank you. And uh, we'll move then to Treasurer. I uh, open the floor for nominations for Treasurer of the Board. I'd like to nominate uh, our Senior Vice President of uh, Finance and Business Operations and current CFO, David Masteron. Okay, is there a support? Second. It's been properly moved in uh, second. Are there any other nominations? All in favor then to close nominations and elect David Masseron as treasurer of the board for 2022, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations, David. And then uh, finally, I open the floor for nominations for secretary of the board. I'm asking for a motion. I nominate Julie Miller. Okay, moved. Uh, uh, and is there a second? Support Kumar. Support. Okay, it's been properly moved and seconded. Are there any other nominations? All in favor to close nominations and elect Julie Miller as Secretary of the Board for 2022, signified by aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations. Um, we'll move on then to the uh, final uh, part of the agenda for this afternoon. We've now reached the uh, public comment section of the agenda. Uh, the secretary has received two requests from members of the community to address the board. These individuals will be joining the board in audio format. Each speaker will have three minutes to present their statements and will receive a one minute warning prior to the three minute um, a time from the secretary to let them know that their time is almost up. The uh, first speaker is Justin Sherman. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as stated, my name is Justin Sherman. I'm a senior here at Wayne State. Um, it's an honor to be able to speak to you today. Thank you to everyone on the board for this opportunity to touch on some recent events regarding anti-Semitism on campus. To begin, last May, during the most recent spike of violence between Israel and Hamas, President e Professor Edith Kavinsky placed a sign on her office door. The sign was a plea for resolution and peace during the fighting. The following day, the sign was defaced with free Palestine and Israeli apartheid. The sign was moved to an advisor's door, and I quote from the advisor, to create a learning experience in defacing peaceful messaging. The sign was again defaced with more anti-Semitic rhetoric and eventually removed. This isn't the first time the Jewish community has been targeted at Wayne State. Five years ago, Students for Israel hosted Peace Week, an annual week-long event promoting communication, coexistence, and community. On the Monday of Peace Week, one such attraction was a mural that was to be painted by the students of Wayne State. Messages of love and tolerance filled the space with a feeling of welcomeness. 
but this feeling was not, was not to last. Two students sprinted over to the mural with cans of spray paint and wrote over the messages, free Palestine, death to all Israelis. The following week, students of the Justice of Palestine hosted their annual Apartheid Week in the same spot as Peace Week. Instead of panels promoting peace and tolerance, images of hate and culture boycotts filled the campus. I was a first semester freshman during this time, but what I learned was the feeling of welcomeness and community seemed to be, seemed to be conditional as a Jew. In 2019, swastikas were found in the Hebrew room in the Nubian Hall. They were drawn on a mural depicting the history of the Hungarian people. On this mural was a Hungarian freedom fighter from World War II, an actual depiction of someone who fought Nazism and hate and drawn right below him were two swastikas. For some reason, this one has always affected me the most, more than any other instance on campus. Here was a painting of someone who fought to defend the world against the Third Reich, the manifestation of someone who may have died defending his people and drawn underneath him were swastikas. The man painted can't erase these symbols. He's just a painting. One minute left. Senseless. And here we are in the Hebrew room with more imagery of a time when the world turned their back on us. In the summer of 2021, Wayne State Student Senate passed a resolution to endorse the boycott, divest, and sanction movement against the Jewish state, a movement no different than the Nazi boycotts of Jewish businesses of the 1930s. This group of students is meant to symbolize the student body and they vote to boycott the Jewish state. Conditional welcomeness, the perpetual feeling of being an other, an afterthought. Although we had our allies in the world who stood up for us, they remained in the minority and continued to be ostracized simply for defending us. The OMC Corps of the same year, an outside group with a long documented history of anti-Semitism and racism come to our campus. This group brought posters and illustrations uh, likening environmentalism to Nazism. One poster reading, green energy, more efficient than Auschwitz. This time was different though, because for the first time the student body came to our defense hundreds of dislikes and shares on social media and reports to the Dean of Students Office to fight against this kind of bigotry. The student body seemed to recognize this imagery and hate. Finally, it was, as if, it, it was as if the conditional welcomeness seemed to have faded like a distant nightmare, but this didn't seem to last. Once again, there are calls on campuses targeting the global Jewish community. As the annual apartheid week nears once again, it is clear that we don't get to define anti-Semitism. Sure, the community stood behind us for one type of Jewish hatred, but not another. When can we decide what anti-Semitism is? Uh, there, these are not the only instances of anti-Semitism that have been experienced on campus, but for the sake of brevity, these are the ones that time has allotted me to touch on. Along with these events, or, yeah, along with these events that have plagued the experiences of Wayne State's Jewish community, many of us have decided to fight back. With the council of Hello of Metro Detroit, um, uh, Justin, go ahead and, and please just conclude. Uh, thank you. So, uh, in counseling with the Hill of Metro Detroit, the Anti Defamation League, the Jewish Community Jewish Community Relations Council, and the American Jewish Committee, we the Jewish uh, we the Jewish Community of Wayne State urge the board to adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance or IRA's working definition of anti-Semitism. The definition is as follows and was presented to the board: Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews, rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed towards Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property, towards Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. Having been a student here at Wayne State for the last four and a half years and having the majority of my family having gone here, it saddens me that I have to address the board today for this reason. All these events that I have spoken about today continue to reopen generational wounds that seem to refuse to heal especially today, the day following International Holocaust Remembrance Day. It is time for Wayne State to take a stand against anti-Semitism. I would also like to submit for the record letters of support from the ADL and the JCRC AJC encouraging Wayne State to adopt the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism. Thank you for your time. Justin, thank you very much and thanks for your um, very um, passionate, um, um, well, you know, it's, I'm sure that the, uh, the the board will 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 take uh, your statements and advisement, and and we'll get back to you. Uh, the next is going to be um, next speaker is uh, James uh, Gallant. Yes. Hello, my name is James Gallant. I'm with the Marquette County Suicide Prevention Coalition. These are my opinions, and uh, I requested. I, I trust that you got my written request 
and I requested five minutes according to the bylaws, and I would expect five minutes, and I'd hope you let me run one more minute. I have two important issues for you. And the first is your suicide prevention efforts of the university and the contents of the mental health assessments administered under Wayne State University's jurisdiction. It's my understanding that the state of Michigan requires providers to use a nationally validated assessment tool, and I, am, I assume that you do, and yet there's also another law that requires an individualized written plan of services, and that's under MCL 330.1712, and that in the mental health code requires that the IPOS to be based on an assessment of a person's need for legal services. And that is generally not in, and I've never seen it in a nationally validated assessment tool. Those are mainly uh, food, shelter, clothing, medical care, you know, needs of a human being. And I, and I have the assessments myself from Northern Michigan University and Macomb County uh, Intermediate School District, and they do not have uh, needs for legal services. And also the Developmental Disabilities Assistance Act of 2000 requires that individuals with developmental disabilities shall be provided with opportunities and supports to live their life with free of violations of their legal and human rights. And please refer these issues to your health affairs committee. And 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. And these are the children that have the custody and parenting time and the conflict and dysfunction that happens is what generates the risk for suicide. And also concerning your recent bylaws amendment, I would ask you to please be willing to reconsider the bylaws decision and refer that back to the bylaws revision committee for the sake of transparency, as the chair mentioned a minute ago, and schedule a public hearing since none of those meetings were open for public comment on any of those. And according to the bylaws, you know, the equity will only happen when everybody's following the rules. And like you approved your excellent University of Excellence contract with the, uh, for the university there. And yet the chair assigned the floor for discussion before there was a motion, which is a contradiction to Robert's Rules of Order, page 366, line 8, rules incident to debate. There shall be no debate before there's a motion that's seconded, and, and then you can have debate. And you assign the floor first. It seems like a regular, like in practice, it's not really, really the regular Robert's Rules. So I would ask you to refer this back to the Bylaws Revision Commission Committee. Mm -hmm. so that you can have a public hearings and then you the um three to five minutes here i expect five minutes because it says three to five minutes and who approved that rule mm -hmm. that's not that's not a specifically accurate amount of time and uh, so i think it's five <laughs> and uh and also the uh excluding a person from future meetings for violating the rules today is forbidden by state law already it's enumerated in state law now that that's forbidden so I'm not sure why the members here think that that's reasonable to do that when the state of Michigan does not. And your executive committee just went into closed session today, right? And where was this transparency? You see, the, this is just means that under Robert's Rules of Order, that's committee of the whole. There's, there's a chapter on that. You don't just get to say executive committee so it's not open to the public. That's committee of the whole because the committee has all the members of the full governor's board is on the committee. So that's like committee of the whole. So that's a public meeting also. It should be. And I would ask you to please, uh, like I said, refer this back to the, the bylaws revision commission committee and the, uh, the health affairs committee so that the, uh, and the suicide prevention, you know, the, that's the point is in the assessments given at Northern Michigan university. This is where this all started. Is, you have one minute left. At, well, I get five minutes here. Okay. I expect five yes, minutes I'm because at, it says five minutes. minutes and, that's, and if I don't get five minutes, then we'll just have to talk about that later. So, <laughs> But this seems very unreasonable, and I, I noticed now I well, now I understand why nobody really wants to participate at your meetings, and if I don't get it, and I learned this because in your student senate has approved their own constitution, and it doesn't include Robert's Rules of Order, and I learned this from an Anthony Ede. He said that he was been a former president of the student senate, and that the student senate turned into a private nonprofit corporation in ninety in two thousand twelve, and it's not a part of the governance of the university anymore except for that was created under the constitution, which the student Senate has to follow the bylaws of this board of governors, all the committees, all the, you got a bunch of lawyers there. Come on. You got to go back and everybody has to follow these bylaws of the board of governors. It says for the business of the board and for the governance of the university. So it's every part of the university has to be on the same page. We're not going to get racial equity. Five until, minutes. 
I'm saying that every the people are not going to be any racial equity until everybody's following the rules, including this board of governors. And uh, so I would ask you to please allow, please vote to please allow me to vote to allow me five minutes. No, you so have my is now interfering. I, the, the president is interfering with the board here. Wow, where's the chair? Where's the chair? I get five minutes, right? Have, it's you, like five minutes in the rules. You voted to say five minutes. I've gone past five now. You, yeah. well, you see, now I shouldn't have had to argue with none of you about none of that. See, that's what's unreasonable about this. So please refer this to committee and we can get back with those bylaws for an open meeting, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gallant. Thank you. And I, I please, okay. we can talk. We got calls. I've talked to you this time. You won't even talk to me. I didn't get a recall call. Come on. Please, Mr. President. Thank you. Okay. Um, people are kids. Kids are killing themselves here, and there's suicide happening all over. And the, the, public the girls comment, are up, uh, 50, up 51 percent. Up 51 percent from the attempt to suicide. The, the public comment uh, period is uh, now over, um, and there be no further business. Uh, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>